During last year, I received a request to join an online kirtan for world peace, chanting for world peace. I didn't acquiesce. Boo. Why not? That's not good. Someone's asked you to chant for world peace. What could be better than that? Chanting. The whole movement is chanting. And then for world peace. What, what, a, what a high, noble <clears throat> desire. And bring the, the spiritual and then the spiritual chanting of the holy names for world peace. Now, Kirtan can bring world peace, and it's the only thing that's going to bring world peace. But we also need to tell people why there is not world peace. That's also required. Um, you can't expect to massively slaughter animals and have world peace. You can't expect to massively slaughter children in the womb. It's called abortion. Fetus removal, tissue removal, euphemistically. You can't expect to, to have this and have world peace. You can't expect to promote lust, greed, anger, envy, illusion, and atheistic propaganda. There is no God. Uh, where is God? We didn't see God. Science has proved there is no God. You can't expect to promote all these things and have world peace. The peace formula is given in the Bhagavad Gita. Srila Prabhupada often cited this. Uh, when Srila Prabhupada came to America in 1965, uh, it was a major topic of concern among the young people who are mostly the people that gravitated around him, the middle class young people. And not all of them, but those who did gravitate around him were mostly middle class and younger people, hippies were mostly the people who came to him. It was a major concern for them about peace, particularly the Vietnam War was going on at that time. And it wasn't that the hippies were <clears throat> feeling great compassion for the Vietnamese, <clears throat> but they were feeling compassion for themselves. They didn't want to get drafted and sent off to Vietnam. And nor did the girls want the hippie boys to be drafted off because they believed in free love. And if you believe in free love and you're not a lesbian, which wasn't that popular in those days, then you need someone to freely love you. And mostly they wanted hippie boys. So there was a lot of concern about peace. And Srila Prabhupada propagated what he called the peace formula. There is a formula. There is a method. There is a specific means by which peace can be achieved. And it's not something that Srila Prabhupada made up. He didn't make up anything. Philosophically, he did. I mean, he made it, he invented simply wonderful sweet balls, which would give uh, macrobiotics nightmares. But actually, <laughs> it gave them Krishna consciousness. That's another topic. Uh, <clears throat> Philosophically, Srila Prabhupada didn't invent anything. And that was one thing which he stressed again and again and again. What is his authenticity? Because he just speaks the same message. It's what's true is true is true in the past, the present, and the future. Two plus two equals five. No, no, not true. Two plus two equals four. That right is it's not a matter of opinion. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Okay. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
fact, uh, which is backed up by Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, and he cites so many authorities also, Ahastvangrishaya sarve devarshinaradas tata asito devalo vyasa swayam chayva bhavishi me. The fact that you, Krishna, are param brahma, param dhamma, pavitram, paramam, you are the supreme absolute truth, the supreme abode, the supreme pure. This is, Arjuna says, uh, born out, not something that Arjuna made up, but by all the great rishis and sages, and he mentions a few names, Asita, Devala, Vyas, Narada. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives all knowledge required for spiritual perfection, and he also gives all knowledge, in at least in seed form, uh, for achieving peace in this world, <clears throat> ashantasya kutasukam, for those who are not peaceful, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, where is the happiness? There is no question of happiness. So the peace formula Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita, and probably, probably, um, most of those who are listening to this talk, uh, they are aware of that, or many of them will be aware of that. The peace formula for, from Bhagavad Gita uh, at the end of the, the last verse of the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Bhuktaram yagya tapasam sarva loka mahishvaram suhridam sarva bhutanam gyatva mang shantim richati. Note the penultimate word there, shantim. It's a, it's a well known word which means peace. Mm. The import of this verse is that a uh, person wise persons, sages, know that Krishna is the supreme enjoyer of all Bhaktaram uh, Yagya Tapasam, of all sacrifices and austerities because uh, people who lead a pious life. They want sacrifice, they want to offer to God, or they, they take up some restrictions in their life. They, they lead a pure life for the sake of pleasing God. So this can be done to invoke the mercy of God so that one can be blessed with him for material benedictions. But Krishna says that one who knows that actually all religious activities and all activities should be done for Krishna's pleasure only. Such a person can attain peace. Uh, and even if we are not specifically religious, <laughs> we perform sacrifices and austerities. People, they work hard to get money to maintain their families, or to get money for quote, unquote, enjoying themselves. So they also perform, in one sense, a sacrifice, and they undertake some difficulty. But Krishna says it should be known that everything, see, the lizard is agreeing. I don't know if you heard in the background. The lizard, if he'd have listened to what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, he wouldn't have become a lizard. Now he's realizing so, bhuktaram yagya tapasam. Yeah. When we realize that everything should be done for Krishna's pleasure only, then we get peace. Because as long as we're acting with the idea, let me get for my own pleasure, we never get peace because there is no pleasure on the platform of being separated from Krishna. The idea of sensual enjoyment. It's very alluring to us, and the whole world is going on after this allurement, like a, the proverbial donkey chasing after the carrot on a stick. It's always just ahead of him, but he never reaches it. 
I've never seen that. I, I've seen plenty of donkeys. Probably if, if I'd have stayed all my life in London, I would not have seen donkeys hardly ever. But living in India, neighboring countries, you used to see a lot more. Now donkeys have been replaced by uh, tuk, 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 these uh, tempos. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I never saw it <laughs> being the, the carrot on a stick. I, and then maybe that's an English saying. It, 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 the stick goes on the behind of the donkey. If he doesn't walk, <laughs> he gets beaten on the back, on the on the rump. <laughs> anyway, the idea that let let me get sense enjoyment, then I'll be happy. It's the pervasive and pernicious and perennial illusion of material existence that I will be happy by sense enjoyment. And it, there might even be some happiness there, but what what is that? Visha Vishendriya Sam Yogam uh, what is that? Visha Yatad Agre Mritopamam. Vishendriya Sam Yogam Yatad Agre Mritopamam Pariname Vishamiva Yatsukam Raja Samsmitam. Krishna describes in Bhagavad Gita. Really, we should study Bhagavad Gita. There's everything we need to, the best guide for our life, Bhagavad Gita, as it is. So Krishna very uh, aptly says, it's absolutely true, it's not a spiritual or religious belief. Krishna says that, well, you, can, you can see, we can all see in our own life, that the enjoyment that comes from pushing the senses onto their objects. I'm, I'm Niyukt Lagana. What, what's the word? Joining. Joining. Joining the senses with the sense objects. Uh, let me see something beautiful. Let me hear something beautiful. Let me touch something that I I like. In the beginning, it seems, ah, so nice. But this sense enjoyment ultimately leads to poisonous effects. It, it, it entangles us in material existence. And there, there are so many statements like this in Bhagavad Gita, in different angles. So when we understand that we should engage our senses for Krishna's pleasure, then instead of this, always there's within our heart, desire, desire, I want something, I want something, I want something. It burns like a fire which is never satisfied. Just with the fire of desire, you put more, put more fuel in the fire. Yes, yes, I want, uh, I want the latest, whatever the latest thing is that people want. Ah, I got it. Ah. Ah, and then, but that stokes the fire more, and then you want something else, and that it's never satisfied. So, the fire of desire that blazes in our heart, we can get peace, respite from that, if we simply offer everything to Krishna, knowing that everything belongs to Krishna, everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. And that doesn't mean that we lead a completely gray, bland, boring life, just the opposite. Because devotees are always trying to get the best things for Krishna. The best flowers, the best food, the best buildings, the best music. Uh, but they do it all for Krishna's pleasure. And automatically the devotees, they also enjoy, but they're not in a spirit of enjoyment but they, they automatically live at the highest level of culture because they do everything for Krishna's satisfaction and they want that everything should be the best for Krishna. And in their heart, they're not just satisfied and peaceful, but they feel great bliss from offering everything to Krishna. They may go through great difficulty to 
collect all the different ingredients for cooking nicely for Krishna. It, it's easier just to get something, some frozen something, take it out of the freezer, chuck it in the microwave and chomp on it. But that doesn't, that might give a little pleasure to the tongue. Might. Uh, it doesn't give any pleasure to the soul. But cooking for Krishna, that gives pleasure to the soul, which is a much deeper pleasure than the pleasure of the tongue. People don't know, so that's why we have to tell them. That's one thing. Okay, one thing. Uh, do everything for Krishna, knowing that he's the enjoyer. Then, Bhoktaram Yagya Tapasam, this is the last verse of the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram, knowing that Krishna is the controller of not just this puny little earth planet. Oh, I'm going like that. It should be like this. That's right. Flat. Oh, don't shoot me for that one. Srimad Bhagavatam says. <clears throat> uh, not only of this earth, but all the planets in the universe, they're all controlled by Krishna. Uh, if we get, if we understand this, then we get peace from the insane desire to control a little piece of land. This is my house. This is my country. We are British. We don't like the Russians. <laughs> what did any Russian do to you? <laughs> That's what the American kids were saying. What are we going to fight? What did the Vietnamese ever do to me? Anything wrong that I have to go there and bomb them and, and get shot by them? Uh, why? Why? It's the tendency of humans to fight. Why? I, I, even animals. The, in the animal kingdom, we find so much violence, but it's, on, it's only for immediate needs. Mostly it's only for immediate needs. Uh, the lion is very fearful, but... The, he won't hunt. He's, you know, he's lazy. He just lies around most of the time. And then when he's hungry, he goes and hunts and gets something to eat. He does. It's not that he kills a whole herd of zebras. He needs one, and then, then he needs something to eat. Then he'll kill one. Enough. <clears throat> but in human society, there's constant killing, not only of animals, but of other humans, why, why? And, and people who are somewhat sensible have been asking this question, they're still answering it, they're still asking it today, why, 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 why create this enmity? Why can't we just all get together, you know, and the Americans and Chinese and the Russians and get, get all together and sort things out, be reasonable and uh, why fight? Uh, and to what horrible extent war has gone. Previously, wars used, but used to be between two armies of able-bodied men. Nowadays, war means what? You, you press a button and send something from one continent to another and kill a whole bunch of children. <laughs> this is, it, it should be horrific, but we're inured to it. And it certainly doesn't produce any happiness and certainly doesn't produce any peace. How are we going to get peace in the world? Well, that's what they're saying, chanting for world peace. But we should understand this also. If we <clears throat> uh, don't understand that Krishna is the supreme proprietor, he's the supreme father, then... We'll fight over what doesn't belong to us anyway. My land. This land is my land. I was born in this land and I will die in this land. But it doesn't belong to us. It's, it's, a, it's farcical to think. The land was there before we were born. It remains long after we die. And in between we say it's mine. And we fight over it. This is insanity. But it's so normal, we just accept it as normal. It's so common, we accept it as normal. Abnormality, insanity, is what we call normality. And then you expect peace. How can there be peace? 
Just like if you put a whole bunch of dogs together in a room, you think they're just going to be all peaceful. They're going to be yapping at each other for no reason. Of course, I'm saying in the animal kingdom, the mostly the, the there's non-violence, no more violence than needed. But some some animal, just like a snake, might bite you. I guess that's out of fear. Uh, the mosquitoes they come and bite. That's fine. But they're they're doing so. They that's they, there's a there's a physical function which is fulfilled by them so-called biting. It's not really biting, is it? It's more like uh, injecting. <clears throat> Cats may play with mice and kill them slowly, gradually, torturing them to death. They may do domestic cats uh, or just tabby cats. But in general, uh, we, we won't find any, any creature. Man is, thinks himself to be the privileged and most intelligent species, but in many ways, humans are less civilized than animals. And what is civilized anyway? When some nation, the whole concept of nation is just a, an invention anyway, because there are lands and different people, and they may speak different languages, but it, again, it doesn't belong to us. So, but one, in one geographical area, one people, they, they get it together to, become, to dominate others, and then they build big buildings, and they call it civilization, and say, we're, more su we're superior to you. We've conquered over you. We're superior, and you can see, we ha because we have subdued you. So this... There's no peace as long as we're thinking of conquering others, controlling others, controlling some piece of, like, claiming this is my property. Go to the moon, stick a flag. This is my... Now, now this moon belongs to me. <laughs> Rascals. Then what's the third condition in this peace formula? Sarva Loka Maheshram, Suhridam Sarva Bhutanam. Krishna is the friend of everyone. So why should we fight with anyone? Why should we mistreat anyone? We may have to fight in this world because people make it so difficult. But as far as possible, we should tolerate. But you see, Krishna is the, the best friend of every living being. Then why should we kill animals to eat them? Is not required. Krishna is the father of everyone. You don't recognize, what do you call it? In every language of the world, pretty much, uh, if, at least previously, if someone doesn't have a father, that means born out of wedlock, then there, there are derogatory terms. Bastard, the word is used in English. It, it has a has a particular meaning as of a child who's born out of wedlock. The, the mother is not married and she has a child. It's also used just as a general insult, a swear word, but it has a usage which is a, a valid usage. But nowadays it's not used because so, so many children are bastards. It's just normal. It, and there even uh, unmarried mothers have status. They're favored by the state because they're given money. If, if, you, if you have a child, you're, you're given support, that means the state favors them. Uh, they're given financial support. So, but and in general, uh, traditionally, before they brought in this total insanity society and then encourage young boys to dress like girls and young girls to dress like boys and all kinds of insane things, which if you say, if you even say it's insane, you'll get arrested probably. Uh, <clears throat> but it was an, it was an insult term. If you don't, if you don't know who's your father, then what does that make you? Uh, <laughs> So if we don't know our father, we don't know. We don't even... Atheist. An atheist 
I don't believe in any God. It's like saying, I'm a bastard. It's like saying that. I don't, I don't know who my father is. I don't care for my father. There is no father. So how can you expect peace when, when the, we don't even recognize our father and our friend? Uh, so Krishna says, Bhuktaram Yagya Tapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suhridam Sarva Bhutanam Gyatva Mang Shantim Richati. One who knows these three things, and he says, Rishaya. It means that it should be a simple thing to understand, but generally it's advanced, spiritually advanced people can understand these things because to be spiritually advanced isn't very common. Most people, even if they are materially well advanced or even materially very intelligent, are spiritually dumb, stupid. So this is the formula for having peace individually. And to have a peaceful society, see the dog is barking in the distance. I don't know if you can hear. But to have a peaceful society, you need peaceful individuals. You say, uh, we have a very peaceful, uh, we have a very peaceful terrorist association. Is it possible? Uh, we're, we're, all, we're all terrorists and we live very peacefully. Uh, how is it possible? Your whole life is meant for unpeace, or your whole situation is one of non-peace. And then how can there be peace in society? So this, these truths need to be propagated. It's not enough to say, I believe in God. As our atheistic friends never tire of pointing out, so much war and violence has been propagated in the name of God. <clears throat> you know, misunderstanding of God. And then, of course, they bring Bhagavad Gita. Well, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is inciting Arjuna to fight. Yes, that was a special situation. That's not a general. That's not a, it's not a general uh, prescription for everyone. That you sh every... The message of Bhagavad Gita is not that everyone should be fighting all the time. That was a specific thing for Arjuna. Arjuna was a gentleman, he didn't want to fight. But Krishna told him, in this circumstance, you have to. So fighting may be required, but not that fighting is the substratum of our whole so-called civilization. Tension, competition. What is this? capitalistic society it's uh, based on competition if you can struggle and make it to the top why why should everyone be struggling struggling means struggling against each other cooperation is better peace and it's not enough just to say hey peace man and take us take a pull on a on a reefer uh, no then you may you may say i i don't need all this bhagavad gita for peace i'll just smoke some marijuana but that doesn't satisfy the soul. For that, we have to know who we are as souls and recognize Krishna's supremacy. This is the peace formula. Now, I started this talk, and really the subject of this talk is chanting for world peace. But chanting Hare Krishna, that's absolutely congruent with understanding the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. Mm. And sometimes Srila Prabhupada taught that you don't speak philosophy, just chant first. Let people be purified. And then they then we can speak philosophy. Give them prasadam, let them chant, or at least hear the chanting. When they're a little bit purified, then we can start to give philosophy. Uh, but actually, if we say chanting for world peace, it is a kind of philosophy. It's giving the idea that the purpose of our existence is to live in this world very peacefully and happily, 
for sense gratification because all these people are talking about world peace. They're not talking about surrendering to Krishna. They're not talking about, they're trying, they're trying to get heaven on earth, the kingdom of God on earth without God. They want to have peacefulness so we can all live very peacefully and enjoy ourselves in this world. But the very fact that this world is full of suffering is because we do not recognize that we are meant to serve Krishna. So chanting, yes, but we have to start to give philosophy as soon as possible and not neglect it or ignore it it may not be that we sit everyone down for a Bhagavad Gita class. Not many people will take to that. But there are other means for attracting the attention of the public toward this Gita philosophy, just like doing dramas, uh, exhibitions, diorama exhibitions. There are ways to, because people are on the sensual platform, so we can attract them in a manner that will be uh, immediately understandable. But of course, talking philosophy is required uh, also. Now you may say that, well, in a, yeah, in other words, okay, first of all chanting, but then philosophy has to be there. And I'll discuss this a little more. We can also say, well, by chanting they'll become purified. Yes, but without proper understanding, then Bahujan Makarajari Shravan Kirtan Tabutana Pai Krishna Pade Premadhan. If we're not properly hearing and chanting about Krishna, then we won't develop love of Krishna, which is the ultimate goal of this chanting. My personal experience for several years traveling in the villages of Bangladesh in the 1980s, mostly in the yeah, end of 1979 and throughout the 1980s. So many people were chanting Hare Krishna. Wonderful experience to find so many people with kirtan. Uh, but it was something which I, I just couldn't understand. How is it that they chant Hare Krishna but they eat fish? At that time, the vast majority, vast majority of people who chanted Hare Krishna, which was not a small, I mean, we're talking about maybe several million people here. Uh, they also had fish. It was, it was hard at that time to find someone. It was not hard to find people who were chanting Hare Krishna, but it was hard to find anyone who didn't eat fish, what to speak of other things. Now, they did know it was wrong. Well, they did and they didn't. Often, if you say it's wrong, they'd look at you mystified. Why? You know, a guru eats fish. All these people are chanting Hare Krishna, they eat fish. But then you're, someone would come up with the explanation, it's Ganga fall, it's the fruit of the Ganga. It's just, just like you pick a, a mango from a tree, you pick a fish from the Ganga. So for, that, that was a commonly given explanation. Now, by saying this, we can understand they have an explanation that means, and, and actually the fish is not a fruit. When you kill a fish, you kill an individual living being. When you take a fruit from a tree, you don't kill and the fish struggles. It, it feels distress. Just like you would feel distress if you were swimming in the water and a fish caught you, a shark caught you and wanted to kill you. <clears throat> but they, they'd made an, an explanation which has no basis in any Shastra because why why they make an explanation? Because they can understand actually it's not right. In the deep in the core of their heart, they can understand it's not right. But they have an they have a false explanation. 
So without proper philosophical understanding, people may go on chanting Hare Krishna, but the whole culture of chanting will degrade and people will bring in various wrong philosophies to substantiate, to justify their wrong activities. In other words, if we don't give the right philosophy, they'll give the wrong philosophy. Right philosophy leads to right... Uh, right philosophy means right understanding and right action. It's not just doing a Bhakti Shastra degree. The one has to apply the, the application of that philosophy. It has to be there. And then, right philosophy... But wrong philosophy leads to sin. Or actually, the desire to sin leads to wrong philosophy. That's actually a fact. People invent speculative ideas because they want to avoid what is the clear right path. They're insincere. They're rascals. That was the word that Srila Prabhupada would use. Now, there's no doubt that chanting Hare Krishna can bring auspiciousness even on the material platform. It can bring world peace. In fact, it's the only way to bring world peace if it's not deliberately misinterpreted and misconstrued. Interestingly, uh, Bangladesh at that time, when I was there, it was still, the country was still suffering greatly from the uh, 1971 genocide <clears throat> and destruction of whatever little infrastructure was in the country by the West Pakistan army in the country. Uh, and people wondered, why did that happen? We're, we're devotees of Krishna. Devotees, yeah, but with, with being a devotee brings a lot of responsibility also. If an ordinary man does a, some petty crime shoplifting, then it's, it's not a big thing. You'll be caught by the police. But if a Supreme Court judge is caught shoplifting, it'll be major news because a Supreme Court judge is supposed to know better and to be a paragon of proper behavior. And even it's just anything, a, a, a teacher, if a teacher is having sex with the students, it's considered very bad because they're, they're expected to be, a, not, at least it used to be, that teachers were supposed to be not just imparting knowledge, but they're supposed to be of good character because that will be passed on to the students. That idea is there. Uh, yeah, in, in Bangladesh also, uh, now that the preaching of ISKCON has been going on there since then, started really in, in an organized way in the 1980s, so now we're moving into, yeah, we're in the fifth decade, and it's been quite widespread, and uh, there are many devotees now who don't eat fish because of giving proper knowledge. Yeah, the lizard agrees. Uh, now, world peace, yes, from chanting Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada said, yeah, if you want peace, you have to chant Hare Krishna. Even for rain, Srila Prabhupada said, sometimes said, anad bhavanti bhutani parjanyad anasambhava. Yagya bhavati parjanyo, yagya karma samud bhavaha. Bhagavad Gita, straightforward, simple formula from Bhagavad Gita. All living beings subsist on food. Food is produced from rain. Rain comes from yagya, that means regulated rainfall, which is suitable for agriculture or just suitable for the uh, the forests to, and everything to go on, the regulated rainfall. 
and regulated rainfall comes from proper performance of uh, sacrifices. And sacrifices. <clears throat> the the underlying principle of sacrifice that you you can't perform sacrifice properly unless we follow the Vedic principles. Now in this Kali Yuga, the sacrifice is chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, Yajnai Sankirtana Prayer Yajanti Hi Sumeda Saha. The Kali Yuga Pavan Avatar, the purifying avatar for this Kali Yuga, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is worshipped by the performance of Sankirtan Yajna, the chanting of the holy name, Sarva Jagya Hoite Krishna Nama Jagya Sa. The essence of all sacrifices is chanting the holy names of Krishna. So it is a fact that by chanting the holy names that will bring in material auspiciousness. But that is not the thrust of our preaching. That it, it does work. Um, Srila Prabhupada in 1974 visited Hyderabad, South India, with uh, many of his disciples and there had been drought for months. It was a very severe situation all over the state of Andhra Pradesh, of which Hyderabad was the capital at that time. Now it's bifurcated. A severe drought. So many animals were starving and people were suffering from lack of food. It was a pathetic situation. Uh, <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada, he brought his disciples. He had them perf perform public kirtan in Hyderabad city. There had not been rain for months. Within three days, there was tremendous rainfall. Now, Prabhupada didn't say, we are coming to solve the drought problem. That came as a byproduct. We came to preach love of God. And as a byproduct of Krishna consciousness, there will be adjustment in the material situation also. Because if people, one way we can understand, apart from the intervention of the Supreme Lord, sending rains, tapami aham aham varsham nigrinam yutsrujami cha, Krishna sends the heat, he sends the rain, or he withholds it. He says in Bhagavad Gita, read Bhagavad Gita, please. <coughs> The one result is if people live without exploit without an exploitive spirit, then automatically they will bring a, a better situation in human society, won't it? It's not by having protests and bringing in communism that it, it doesn't change people's hearts. We, there are so many bad things going on in the world. There's the big leaders. Uh, Demons, they're rascals, they're, they're nasty people. Many of the leaders are so, so nicely suit and tie and talk, very sophisticated. But what, look at their policies. They're horrible people. But if we have good people, then automatically the whole situation in society will be better. So chanting Hare Krishna and following the teachings of Bhagavad Gita will make us good people. And then we should live a good life among ourselves. Uh, we know that we, so many devotees and others had this experience. When they came in the presence of Srila Prabhupada, they felt so much purified and uplifted just by being in his presence because he's such a saintly person. That just by being in his presence, you can't imagine doing anything wrong. So we want to have more people like that. Uh, definitely by spreading Krishna consciousness, chanting Hare Krishna, that will bring auspiciousness in the world. That's one of the first gifts of pure devotional service. Kleshagni Shubhada. By pure devotional service, then sinful reactions are destroyed and all auspiciousness is bestowed. But what is that pure devotional service? Pure devotional service means doing it for Krishna's pleasure. 
Bhuktaram Yagatapasam. Everything is done for Krishna's pleasure. Now, sometime in the mid 1970s, the Bag to Godhead magazine, which was being run by Srila Prabhupada's disciples from Los Angeles, I believe at the time, the editorial policy changed from being the, from being the kind of in your face Krishna consciousness to an approach which they thought would be more uh, <clears throat> accessible and understandable to common people. So they presented uh, why I chant Hare Krishna. They had little photos of people and gave their name and gave a little quote from them. Such and such. Robert Grant, printing executive. When I chant, all my stress goes away. Such and such. Housewife. Uh, Chanting helps me to get through the day with ease. And so on and so on. Saying how chanting makes you feel more relaxed, more focused, um, helps you to get free from stress, makes you makes life in the material world better. That was the message that they gave. As <clears throat> Some disciples of Srila Prabhupada weren't very happy with this. They brought it to Srila Prabhupada's attention and he, he said to stop doing this. He said we should propagate we chant Hare Krishna to get love of God, not for any material benefit. So I'm very afraid that this idea, chanting for world peace and similar such initiatives, is to make us the devotees, or supposed to be devotees, look like nice, good, harmless people, which we should be at least materially harmless. Uh, in other, well, we, we, we can destroy your whole society, but we're not, out, we're not going to bang you over the head with an iron bar, just out of malice. So the chant Hare Krishna for world peace, we're trying to present ourselves as good, nice, harmless people who want to help bring a better situation in the world. Which is true, but we want to do that while avoiding telling people things that they don't want to hear, just to make us look very nice and good and inoffensive, something like Dalai Lama or something like that. It's nice, very nice, very nice. Of course, the guy eats meat every day. No sympathy for the Dalai Lama from this part, at least not as, as a living being. We, we are supposed to love everyone, but he's really hypocrite. Uh, so the idea of, uh, yeah, we shouldn't become hypocrites like that. We, we, we're just talking b- compassion, compassion. And then we're, we say, well, our devotees, they don't eat meat, but if we don't give the people the proper understanding, then we're also cheating them. Just giving the idea, we just sing a little bit and uh, there's more. We have to understand, we're doing, our society is on a very wrong track. The, the whole idea, we were bringing world peace, uh, so many people are talking about world peace, making the world a better place, this, this Swedish or Greta, Hansel and Gretel, Greta Thunberg or something like that. Peace, peace, big, big hero, heroine. Oh, she's very good. She wants to bring in world peace and make, make the world a better place for us to live in. But we're not part of that endeavor. We're not a part of an environmentalist movement or a world peace movement. We're part of the Krishna movement. And all these things will follow from Krishna consciousness. Without Krishna consciousness, then forget it. There's a, you can make a few adjustments here and there, but the world's basically hellish, however you adjust it. You may, yes, like adjusting your seatbelt while you're, you're driving in 100 miles an hour into a brick wall. Ah, yeah, now we're very comfortable. No nonsense. 
We have to tell people this is nonsense. It's just, it's just, it's all this. We're feeding school children. Very good. We're feeding school children. Why don't we feed the school children? And then the people will think Hare Krishna people are very good. Uh, the public likes it, and we get lots of money, donations, everyone's happy. But then uh, we have to play along with the public sentiment. We're playing on the public sentiment, and you get things stated. A leader of the ISKCON Society in Bombay, this was 10 years ago or more now, we believe that to feed a hungry child is the best way to serve Lord Krishna. That's not our philosophy. That's more, that's more like the so-called Daridya Narayan philosophy, which is atheism. The best way to serve Lord Krishna is to feed a hungry child. Where, where is it stated? In any Shastra? It's just to get the public sympathy, but we're, we're losing our own teaching. We make hospitals. Uh, we start, oh, okay, we made a hospital. And it's all devotee doctors. Okay, all right, very nice. Yeah, and then you see Bhaktivedanta Hospital is sponsoring some initiative to, what is that? Make the whole of Maharashtra free from some disease or other. I can't. Remember. And, and, and make Bombay plastic free. And we're getting off track here. And then, uh, and then in Hyderabad, someone started the. Cancer free, freedom from cancer. ISKCON is promoting freedom from cancer. That's not why Prabhupada came to this world. To, there are so many people talking about getting freedom from cancer, clean up the environment, pick up the plastic bags. That's not what the Bhagavad Gita teaches. The Bhagavad Gita teaches put Krishna in the center. Everything otherwise is just a bunch of zeros. Don't hide Krishna in the name of preaching. So chanting, yeah, chanting will bring world peace, but we have to tell people why it will bring world peace. And why, there has to be some proper orientation. And if we don't focus, on, if we don't keep clearly focused, now that word focus means concentrated, but the original meaning is to go out of focus, just like this camera which I'm sitting in front of, if it's out of focus, it's not going to go back in focus automatically. It needs to be very finely tuned to get it in focus. And once things are, once our eyesight is out of focus, it doesn't come back automatically. It tends to get worse and worse and worse. And we can't see clearly and we get, so, we get into so many problems. So it's essential to keep properly focused. This idea, that even chanting, and then people will think it's very nice. I just remember a few years ago, I was on Harinam Sankirtan when I was visiting London in England, uh, in the center of London, Saturday night, and I couldn't help but notice that the, the most of the devotees involved in the kirtan, they were they were reciprocating with the public, smiling at them, but I, I got the feeling it was more like a mood of, hey, the public are out on Saturday night in London, they come to have a good time. And it's more like the feeling I got was that the devotees were smiling, waving at the people. It's not a bad thing, but it was more like, yeah, you're out for a good time. Yeah, well, this is good. This is fun. All right, this is fun. But I noticed also that my one godbrother, Sakshi Gopal Prabhu, he was leading the kirtan in a very different mood, a very, very meditative, meditating on the holy names. And when he gave, he gave a talk, short talk, which we often do when we're in public, chanting the holy names, we stop and talk. He gave a talk, and it wasn't just, oh, chant Hare Krishna, be happy, smile, very, just two minutes, but very seriously speaking, the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. <coughs> so, uh, chanting Hare Krishna for world peace. I didn't join in. Uh, didn't join in because I, th I th thought the uh, th there's a seed suggests to me there's a seed of something not quite right there. Uh, 
chant Hare Krishna for Krishna's pleasure, not from musical entertainment. That you can also stoba, hela, or what is that? I'm just not remembering. Vaikuntha nama grahanam asheshaga harang viduhu. Even if we chant the holy names, uh, for even for some entertainment, we can be free from sins. But that won't in and of itself purify the heart in the same way as chanting without offenses, simply for the pleasure of Krishna. So that we have to keep in mind always, and we have to preach it among ourselves. And remember that this Krishna Conscious Movement was founded, founder Acharya, his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, uh, he came from the spiritual world to give us the proper understanding of who is Krishna, who are we, uh, how to act in devotional service, the aim of doing so. In other words, Sambandha Gyan, Abhideya, Prayojana, all these things he gave us. We might not understand fully everything, why he did, what he did, what he wanted us to do, but we should know that if we follow that, uh, we will be benefited. Otherwise, if we become blind men following the blind, yata, andha yata andai rupa niyama anasti pisha tantram urudam badha, we'll just remain tied up in material existence. We have to follow the liberated souls who can see clearly oma jnana timirandhasya jnananjana shalakaya chakshurin militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha we pray that my spiritual master opened my eyes by applying the my blinded eyes by applying the ointment of knowledge so let us execute krishna consciousness in that way don't be servants of the public chant Hare Krishna for Krishna's pleasure and for benefiting the whole world in the way that Krishna teaches us. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vancha kalpa tarubhyas chakripara sindhubhya evacha patita nam pavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo Namo Namaha Dante Nitaya Tuna Kang Padayani Patya Kritva Chakaku Shatameta the Humbra Vini He Sadavasakala Eva Vihaya Duranga Ranga Chanda Charne Kuruta